So we'll talk about some of the production and the techniques and the technology. So when we're talking about production, your bed length is often a reflection of how big your farm is and how much product you think you can move. So I generally work with things that are based on a 100 foot increment. So it's a 25, 50, or 100. And on the smaller farms, so quarter acre type farms, I like to do 25 foot beds because that way, like it's a smaller farm, you're moving less, less product. I want a smaller unit of production because that unit of production represents how much I think I can sell in any given week. And I always like to be in a position where I go and I crop out the entire bed that I get, so I get consistency. So in the, in the case of cut and come again salad greens, you want to harvest the whole bed at once because if you just go and harvest five feet of it, then you go and harvest it the next few days, well that stuff you didn't cut's longer and then the other stuff's coming along. So you get inconsistencies in your product, which customers don't like. So the other reason I want to crop out the entire bed is that say it's a, a, a bed like radishes, I want to just go and harvest the whole thing, clean the bed up, re-amend it, and plant again. That way my production cycles stay on time, they stay on point. So that way we're not running into any barriers as to running out of places to plant. Because on a, on a small market garden like this, where we want to maximize production, at a certain point we're going to run out of places to plant. Usually for us on our farm, by mid-May there's nowhere else to plant. Every, we have about 100, 100 beds, 150, 100, 50 foot beds on our farm, by mid-May every bed's already planted. So that means that I have to have enough coming off so that I can re-amend that bed and keep going. So my general rule of thumb is if your farm is a quarter acre or smaller, do increments of 25 foot beds. Do, plan out your farm that way. And there's exceptions to that. But, uh, so, so, so on a larger farm, so our farm's a third of an acre, I like 50 foot beds because that's a unit of uh, product that I can move. I can harvest an entire bed of red Russian kale and I'm going to play a short little video of you, uh, for, uh, of me harvesting that. And I can move that much product at once. So that's a unit that works for me. And that, that keeps my production maxed out to its capacity. And sometimes it's two beds of this or four beds of this, depends on the crop. And it also depends on your physical limitations. So I, I'm, I'm physically constrained on my farm because of the physical barriers around. So I can't really do much more than a 50 foot bed anyways, but I like that unit as a measure of production. So on our farm in a high rotation area, which is exactly this, each of these 50 foot beds will be harvested, re-amended and replanted four times, sometimes even more per season with quick growing crops, meaning that each of these beds will generate at least $1,600 of revenue in an eight month growing season. You get into greenhouses and stuff like that, then that's a whole other ball game. And there's some crops that are even different. On a larger farm, so this is Jean-Martin Fortier's new farm called Les Fermes des Quatre Temps, just north of here. This is a massive market garden, it's three acres. This isn't even all of it, this is probably a quarter of it. 100 foot units work for them because that's a measurable amount of product that they can move on a, on a daily or weekly basis. And it just makes sense for their, for their production. So the thing with the divisible by 100 type bed also just makes sense from a material standpoint. Irrigation piping comes in 100 foot rolls. Greenhouse poly comes in 100 foot rolls. Um, insect netting comes in 100, 200, 300 foot rolls. So there's, there's just a practicality of that there as well. What they've done on their farm here is they've divided things up into blocks. So ju just like how on my farm I've got plots, uh, bl a block of 12 beds here, a block of 10 beds here, so on and so forth. They've standardized everything to a 10 bed block. And what they've done on their farm, which is really cool, is they have these, uh, these uh, perennial areas called hedgerows that encourage beneficial insects and bugs and, and, and predator and prey. It's, the kind, it, it, it's, it's what makes me want to be a rural farmer is that you can try things like that. It's a little harder to do these things in an urban context. But so, so the 100 foot bed works for them. And so in, in Jean Martin's case, these beds are all generating and he, he basically, I gave him all the crops that I grow and he scaled it. So he's 10 X to my farm. I'm a third of an acre. This is a three acre market garden. These beds are all making $3,200 a season. 
So this is where we're going to see market gardening hit the million or the, the, the seven figure type of uh, production. And so it's an experiment, it's, it's a constant learning process, but that's what they're doing there. I have videos with Jean Martin and that farm on my YouTube channel if you're curious. So there's exceptions to the rules. There's, there's always ways to break the rules and it's always fun to break the rules depending on the context. And f for myself, when, I, when, I was, when my farm was a lot smaller and I had less land, I was about a quarter acre at, at, at a certain point in my farm, I had nowhere else to go. I didn't, I didn't have the space for 50 foot beds. But I found ways to continuously squeak out a little bit more production here and there depending on my situation. And so I, I did this just by accident in the sense, well, I, I kind of creatively came up with this idea just by noticing that I was always planting two beds or four beds of radishes and arugula every single week during my main season. So from mid-May to early September, I was planting those crops in those even increments. And I was always harvesting those crops at that time too. So I was always harvesting or cropping out two beds of arugula or two beds of radishes at a time. And in the summertime, those crops are 21 days fast, super fast crops. They grow faster than weeds. So I found a way that if I could just temporarily forfeit the walkway between two 30 inch beds, so I, I got an extra 10 inches, I could squeeze an extra three rows of radishes or an extra four rows of arugula in that crop, thereby giving me an extra 21 to 22% of, of product. And because I don't need to manage that crop, I don't need to weed it, it grows so fast and it's in and out of the ground, what do I need that walkway for? I could technically, if I, had, if I was doing four beds at a time, I could forfeit this walkway and do the whole thing. Might be hard to seed in there if you didn't have anywhere to walk, but you could technically do it because the whole crop's gonna be out at once anyways and then I can just reshape the beds again once I'm done. So I could just squeak a little bit more out here, here's an example of that. Harvesting this arugula, this is in the walkway. I'm just stepping, stepping on the walkway again, and then that bed might, th that block might just go back to two 30 inch beds with that walkway going back to being a walkway. So it's a temporary thing. This doesn't work with a crop like carrots that takes a lo that longer to grow. Um, it doesn't work with any, any type of longer season crop. This is really only for like 30 days or less type crop that, that will compete with the weeds. So another way we've found ways to get more production, I talked about this a little bit in the keynote I believe, is to stack things and to verticalize space. So the stacking is using time as a way to overlap production. So I have a medium time based crop here, a long time based crop here with the tomatoes and a short term based crop there with the microgreens. That's a crop every single week. This is a crop every single days or every 10 days. And this is a crop that will take once it's planted a month and a half to start fruiting. But while that crop is growing and fruiting, I can use the land here because as this crop grows, it doesn't interfere with the soil because we plant them deep in the ground, but the light doesn't interfere either. Because even if the tomatoes are like two feet tall, there's still enough sunlight that comes down to the ground to get that lettuce to grow. So I can still be harvesting that lettuce. The only time we, the only time we get to a point where we can no longer harvest that lettuce is when the tomatoes are about four feet tall, they've shaded that ground out. But the thing there is at that point, that's probably mid-May, field production is totally online and we've got stuff coming off everywhere else. So we're no longer as dependent on the production of this greenhouse. But it allows us to just maximize our greenhouses on the times when the other field stuff is, is slower to grow. So we're getting consistent production out of this. And so this is how it looks like on a time base level. In the springtime, the greenhouses are planted with cool weather crops. So these are unheated greenhouses. So I'm primarily growing things that can handle below freezing temperatures. Radishes can do that, turnips can do that, spinach can do that, lettuce can do that, arugula, mustard greens, tatsoi, any type of Asian type green, bok choy. These things can handle freezing temperatures. In fact, they make them taste better. They, 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 the starches turn to sugars and they, they have a, 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 a specific taste, a unique taste. So all the greenhouses are maxed out in the spring and then we start to interplant our tomatoes into there. So uh, in previous years, we did it right on the edge of the bed, 
partially into the walkway. Right now, as we speak, we're, we're experimenting with a new way of putting it in the middle of the bed and planting amongst it. If you watch my YouTube channel, you'll see us do that. So we're constantly experimenting, but this allows us to just keep the production going with the other things growing. So by the summertime, the tomatoes have taken over the greenhouse. Those, that lettuce is long gone and it's out in the field and everything on the farm is, is, is pumping out as much as it possibly can. And um, so we're, we've completely maxed out our vertical space. So there's no, there's no sunlight going to the bottom at this point. But the way we manage our tomatoes is a method called hard pruning. And I'll explain more about that in a second. But basically what we're doing is we're pruning all the sucker branches. Do I have a, I think I have a slide of this. We're pruning all the sucker branches, which is the, the branch between, it's, it's in the crotch of basically a main branch and the main leader. We prune all those off and we, we, we twist our tomatoes up a string so they grow vertically. This only works with indeterminate tomatoes. And so we do that consistently and as the, as the tomatoes start to bear fruit, then we strip every single branch off underneath there. So by the time we get into early September, which that looks like what this photo is, we get to a point where there's about four feet of bare stem there. As the sun comes back lower in the sky, so this is universal for us in the northern hemisphere, the sun comes lower in the sky in the fall equinox, now that light can actually reach through the pruned and, and, and manicured canopy of what was those tomatoes. Now it can reach the ground. I can go and reprep these beds and interplant greens just like I had in the spring. And then as I go into fall, I have greenhouses that are full of cool weather crops that I can be harvesting up until Christmas. So that's unheated greenhouses. And you can do this with, with heated greenhouses too, and you can do it more extremely. And so hard pruning is, is an incredible way of, ma of just maximizing the production of your tomatoes. It only works with indeterminate. So this doesn't work with your beefsteak, garden variety, you know, uh, tomato in a tomato cage. This is specific types of tomatoes. And it does require work. In the summertime, Roger, he, he's my tomato guy. He's my, my neighbor. Him and his wife manage our tomatoes. And in the summertime, they probably spend five to 10 hours a week. I would say from early July until mid-September, 10 hours a week managing tomatoes. So pruning them, constantly staying on top. And the great thing about hard pruning is not only that it creates that opportunity to interplant again in the fall, but it, re it reduces disease because you get airflow at the base of the tomato. And we plant our tomatoes 10 inches apart. They're quite intensive. And um, so it reduces disease, brings in airflow. The thing that I love about it from a production standpoint, I, I mentioned this in my last talk, is that at any given time in the summer, I can walk in my greenhouse and go, oh yeah, I've got about 50 pounds on that row. I've got about 30 pounds on that row. I can visually see the fruit. So it's, 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 it's easy to get a sense of where I'm at with production. And it's also easier to harvest because you don't have to push through leaves. And I hate getting tomato uh, leaves on my skin. It, it, <laughs> people are nodding. It, 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 I, get, I get sort of an allergic reaction to it. So I, I, I prefer to do that. So the, the other thing that we've done in our farm that allows us to increase production was initially done out of the good intentions of that I didn't want to rototill the soil because there is a biology in the soil and if we're organic farming, we are essentially dependent on biology to grow our crop opposed to uh, petrochemical fertilization. So we need biology. So we need a symbiosis of bugs and bacteria to grow our crops. And so uh, a deep rototill disrupts that cycle. And I'm not saying don't rototill because we still rototill in the right context, the time and place. But generally speaking, we don't have to. So this was done out of good intentions, but it's amazing how much it's reduced our weed pressure. Because when you rototill, what you do is you are putting down in the ground any weed seeds that have blown in. So weeds are always coming in everywhere. Weeds are blowing in from everywhere all the time and they blow and they land on the soil, you rototill, you bank those into the soil and they'll sit there for a hundred years. And then, it, and then you, but when you till, you're also bringing up any weed seeds that were down there from before. So you're continuously banking and bringing up more weeds in your rototill. So just from a strictly practical standpoint, like forget the ecological reason, from a practical standpoint, rototilling causes weeds. 
And we, this is part of our multifold strategy of weed reduction on our farm is that we only do a shallow tilth. So we use a tool called the tilther and it does rototill technically, but only the top inch of the soil. So most of the biology exists underneath that top layer. And so we've, we, we haven't been disrupting the biology, which gives us better yields, but also reduces our weed pressure because we deal with the weed pressure on top as we, uh, as we manage our beds. And the tarps are a huge part of this. So this is a multifold strategy. I'll talk about the flame weeder um, a little bit later, but it's, it's shallow tilth tarps, uh, e even using landscape fabrics and, um, and the flame weeder to mitigate weed pressure. So what we do on our farm, our rule of thumb is that if a bed isn't in production, meaning it isn't planted, it's always covered. There's nowhere on our farm where you'll see bare exposed soil that isn't either planted or, or got a crop in it. We always cover the soil and that's what happens in nature. nature. Nature does everything it can to cover the soil and green the soil. The only time you see bare soil is, is if uh, it's been a cut bank or something has been disrupted. Nature wants to do everything it can to cover the soil and so that's what we do. So the tarp has a multifold effect. One, by covering the beds that we've prepared. So we've just formed, we've shaped all these beds, put in our compost, and then they're not going to get planted right away, so we tarp them. What we usually do is we'll water the beds in heavily, we'll run the sprinklers for an hour, then put the tarp on that. The tarp prevents any new weeds from blowing in, but it also creates a, a little microclimate of heat and humidity under the tarp to encourage weeds that are there to germinate. And so that tarp will expedite those weeds germinating and then we can pull that tarp off if we want to plant right away and go into the flame weeder and just torch the very top millimeter of the soil, it doesn't hurt the soil at all, and plant right away. Or we can keep the tarp on long enough to just smother the weeds out altogether. So this is a, a multifold strategy that allows us to barely ever have to manage weeds. So here's low-till bed preparation this is like every single week of the farm. This is, this is what's happening every single Monday and Tuesday on our farm. We are harvesting a bed. So here was a bed of arugula. This is probably the second or third cut. It had been harvested a few times. We harvest it. One person takes that right back to the walk-in cooler and, and deals with that and goes to something else. One person stays behind. In this case, it was me. And I go in with a stirrup hoe, which is the loop hoe, basic farm tool, and I shank that crop off at the base. In, with a root crop scenario, I wouldn't have to do this because the root crop is harvested and then I can pretty much turn the bed over from there. But in the case of arugula, I go and shank it off at the base. What this does is it, 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 it stuns the plant in that you've killed it essentially, but its root matter stays in the soil and that immediately starts to decompose, which is good for biology. And then we remove that. It goes in the compost pile. And then I come in with an organic fertilizer. This is just tur organic turkey manure, basically. We use a lot of compost at the beginning, but in our rotations in the main season, we use a compact organic fertilizer just because it's more convenient. It's hard to bring mounds of compost in the middle of the summer on an urban farm. So that's why we use that. And then we run the tilther which does that shallow tilth. We rake the bed even, and then we plant right away. Sometimes I don't even need to do the raking, but here's a little high-speed video of me doing it. So I just harvested a bed of radishes. I come in with the tilther. I replant. That's it. That happens every single week from mid-May until mid-September or early September. When we're on our weekly planting cycles, this is what it looks like on our farm. So we're Beds cropped, turned over right away. 